at NerdStalker on Twitter. And you are? Greg Glory, a.k.a. Social Greg on Twitter and of the NerdStalker Media Network. Thank you so much. Wow. Yeah. What a week. Gosh, what a, yeah, what a week. Um, so hopefully, you know, typically we release this thing, these things a few days after the actual recording's up to a week possibly, uh, depending on editing and stuff like that. So hopefully some of this will, hopefully everything has calmed down by the time you are listening or watching to this. But um, so this may not be ever evergreen uh, content, but we definitely need to, you should touch on what's in the zeitgeist at, as of this recording, as I like to say. Um, so, Greg, your your thoughts on uh, and we're talking about the United States. What what's happened here? Yeah, you know, I thought you know I was kind of like I was getting used to the COVID thing in a funny way. <laughs> right. In a funny way. <laughs> I forgot all about that. Mm-hmm. You know, in a funny way, and then you know Memorial Day came around, and then I think what bubbled up you know, if I kind of recap this a little bit, was really, um, was really kind of Trump's um, and Twitter's thing going back and forth, right? I mean, that was, that was bubbling up. In, in, but then suddenly I saw this little thing, uh, you know, person killed by Minneapolis police, right? Mm-hmm. And then two days later, holy moly, all this, all the video came out. Um, yeah. I, I watched the video. Um, I, I just, I couldn't believe my eyes. I was just thinking like, Oh my God, you know, I mean, and, and it just, you know, I think the first day was really painful for me to watch. I actually stopped watching um, yeah. TV yeah. and other things. And then I, 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 I had a meeting um, at my temple and mm-hmm. um, they said the best thing to acknowledge something and to empathize with something is to feel it. Right. So I had a different approach the next day. Actually, I, I took in everything that I saw. I listened to everybody. I listened to the president, even you know, sure. I listened to everything, and sure. saw what was ha- un- unfolding at the White House. Mm-hmm. And I was just going like, okay, I'm, I'm, I was starting to feel it again, you know. But mm-hmm. uh, how about you? How, how did that kind of whole thing kind of manifest itself for you? You know, it's funny because I, I typically stay away from a lot of the news, uh, television news as much as possible. And I just kind of consume all the stuff mainly online, right? And then social media as well. So there was really no dodging this thing. Um, and let's let's call it for what it, what it was, the, the torture and murder of uh, Mr. Floyd um, by these, um, you know, debatable four police officers, uh, if not two or one. Um, it's up to you how you see this. But I mean, they're all convicted at this point, I believe, or are up for charges, I think, uh, one being, um, as of this recording, right, second degree. Um, I was, uh, in, one, in one instance, I'm almost numb to it because I was so used to seeing th- this type of thing occur in the United States, you know, uh, just shown along with like school shootings and all of this, it's, it's bizarre how it's almost numbed me, you know, to, in a way, to almost expect this. And um, it's it was um, it's it's sad. It really is super sad and and tragic. And and looking at it, you know, I hate to bring this off, but from an actual jujitsu perspective and from what I saw, you know, I, I had tried to avoid this video as as much as I could, but there was no avoiding it. Eventually, I mean, there were stills of it, and and eventually, I, I saw I saw this thing. And from from what I viewed, the Mr. Floyd's, you know, carotids, arteries, we, we do this with any type of rear naked choke in, in jujitsu, is you close these two things called carotid ar- arteries, and then a person passes out, right? And it doesn't take long. Everyone's a little different depending on where your carotteries are in terms of more surface or deeper or what have you. And everyone just has a different proclivity to this. But holding it for that long, as long as they did, is an absolute no-no because you're cutting off blood circulation to the brain and you're effectively causing brain death, you know, at, at a certain point. And, uh, and seeing what I saw and for, what, eight minutes, I, I think, was this the horrific nature of this thing. Uh, it, it was just... It was just horrible. And I think we'd even spoken about before how uh, the average, I, I believe, was uh, four days a year of police training is what I've heard that they get, right, in terms of uh, self-defense and things like that. And oftentimes, um, jujitsu is optional. And a lot of them don't do it because it's kind of, and for a lot of people, you don't want to feel, you don't want to go in there and feel like uh, you don't know anything and you're constantly, you know, you, it, it's an ego thing oftentimes for a lot of men, especially. Um, because you have to admit in a way that you're starting from zero. 
Um, so, so I viewed it from a lot of different lenses, right? As a, a person of color, if you will, and um, uh, a martial arts practitioner and, uh, you know, uh, a patriot, right? Who, who cares about this country and who does want a police presence, who believes, you know, it, I want police in my life, you know, and to protect uh, all of us. And someone who understands that um, there, there's just, there's bad seeds sometimes, you know, and, and undereducated individuals, and, uh, you know, it's, it's tough. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. I, I, you know, I, I didn't think about asking you about this from the jujitsu standpoint, but, you know, I'm glad you kind of um, added that, that extra, extra thing for me, because I, I, I think of what, you know, it teaches and self-defense or defense, how you want to look at it. And it's, it's interesting, you know, these, these things could be dangerous in the uneducated, like you pointed out. So I, mm -hmm. I you know, I think the other thing for me was, is that um, was coming out in the Asian community for me was that there was one Asian officer right. there. Right. Right. And right. then I, I just like, Oh my God, you know, but then, you know, and I started thinking about it this a lot, Adolfo is, is um, you know, what would I do if I was there? You know, mm -hmm. what would yeah. I do if I was there? You know, and, right. and, and, and yeah. that's a, that's a really a, that's really an exposure of, of you when you think about those things, you know, um, really exposes your whole being who you are. And it's sometimes scary when you think about right. that, you know, it's very, very scary. Um, yeah. One of the comments I saw on social media was, it was exactly that. Um, I think a person says, why didn't these people who were filming or whatever intervene? And then someone made a really good point. Have you ever taken on four police officers by yourself? You know? Yeah. So that's, yeah. that's a lot to undertake. <laughs> and yeah. armed, armed police officers and, and see how that ends, you know? And, yeah. And, whew, man. Yeah, that would have been, been very ugly, but, you know. Could have been you. Could have yeah. been you. And so, it, you know, what I'm uh, amazed in a lot of ways of how the nation kind of rose up to all this, um, and, mm -hmm. and started to really, um, you know, speak up, you know, it was like, like, it was like all the frustration of COVID-19 rolled well, up into one, right? Yeah, that's what I was going to say, right? It's a perfect powder keg, right? A situation in that um, there's a longstanding history of, of people watching police brutality on television, especially not seeing enough of the good things that they do. Um, and I, as I said before, and a number of other things, right? Being being shelter in place, and all these COVID-related things that you said, and and one of the things that I mentioned a long time ago, and that it, from economists saying once we once a, a society reaches 25% unemployment, uh, it's chaos, it's chaos, right? And the last the last officially reported unemployment I think was 14.1%, and that was as of April. And Fortune or someone just said that their projections were that we are at 21.5% right now. So if, if you think it's gonna get any better uh, in terms of uh, society, social unrest, and this was one situation, one horrific situation, you gotta think how many of these things happen throughout the world each day, right, of injustices. And when people don't have employment uh, and, and things like that to offset uh, focuses on certain things. And th that's not to diminish the horrific nature of this thing, but it's simply to state that uh, when you're sort of myopic in, in one particular view, whatever it may be, um, it, it, can, it can be dangerous. It can really be dangerous. Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's, um, you know, I think we, we both are people of color and both of our, um, parents, you know, we're first generation born here, right? So, mm -hmm. so, you know, I think that's, that's an interesting thing when I think about it, what you said about, you know, I, I, I do care about the country uh, as well as you do, you know, and I, and I, I, I appreciate the police being in my, in my neighborhood, in my community, because, um, you know, on a daily basis, they're here to protect me, right? Mm -hmm. And, 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 and I think you're right about, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely a few bad eggs in every community, every place you go to, every workplace, um, every place you go, you know, probably even in your jujitsu studio, you know, even though, you know, you, 
don't like to admit those things. Those, <laughs> those are realities, right? Right. You know, mm-hmm. you know, and 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 those people um, will tend to um, do some bad things that will reflect on the whole community, you know? So what are your, what are your thoughts on the state of affairs overall then? Um, all the things that contributed to this in terms of like, you, you mentioned the virus, the economy, uh, maybe maybe our own personal, you know, lack of morals or, or whatever, yeah. whatever it may be, you know? Well, I, I really- Nihilism. Believe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I really believe, you know, being a uh, devout Buddhist too, I really believe that, um, you know, we need to all strive for world peace in some way, you know, and, and I, I was, was really being, um, really being uh, truly um, enamored with the way the whole world was handling this COVID-19 thing, you know, I mean, there was a lot of stress, don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but but we forgot about these border wars for a little bit, if you think about it, we forgot about some of these things and we were just Mm -hmm. focused on trying to solve this COVID-19 thing, Mm -hmm. you know, Um, you know, even with Iran, right. We, we even kind of normalized things a little bit with Iran. I remember it was like escalating right before that COVID thing. And then suddenly, Mm -hmm. you know, we were just all focused on what we needed to do to fight this COVID thing. And it, Mm -hmm. and it goes to show you that like, if we're focused on some things as a, as a world, we could really, um, accomplish some great and beautiful things, I think. Um, Isn't it interesting, like, remember post 9-11, too, of all the global empathy and the sort of uh, the kindness of our neighbors and the person, the stranger next to us uh, at that point, and our admiration to the firefighters and, and the even police at that point, right? And everyone, too, the authorities and even even this, as you were mentioning, post, post-COVID initially, too, how how nice and kind and everything we were to each other and then look look what happens right now you know again as again everyone's out of work i mean yeah we're destabilizing a lot of stuff and i think there's only so much time that that people can can live without money right and the ability to pay for their shelter and food and to support their families yeah, I mean, that ugliness came out with the looting and, and everything else that was just another layer on top of this other right, one. Right, right. And there was some well. some criminality for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not to make excuses for, for any of that action uh, because some people were just destroying stuff to destroy. You know, there's that whole, whole, whole joker mentality of, of wanting to just see the world burn in a way too, that whole nihilistic sort of viewpoint, right? Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of summed it up a little bit earlier when, when, when it reaches a certain unemployment, right? You know, th- there's going to be some anarchy, you know, some bits of anarchy going on, you know? I mean, yeah. um, and I think that's something that we just have to kind of watch and be aware of as, as, as humans on this planet, you know? There's, I think, there's... yeah, I mean, I think it's gotten to a point where um, the majority of people, a lot of people, I think I mean, there was a poll, 40% or something, believe that. Um, the life for their children in the future is going to be worse off than theirs. And that, you know, that's always been a goal of uh, society is to leave this planet in that your children will have it better than you in some way, or at least the chance of having it better than you, right? And at this point, it seems like um, our politicians have failed us, uh, the economists, and, you know, and stock traders and investors and billionaires and everyone has failed us. And, and it seems like that's a general sentiment. And obviously, <laughs> with the icing on the cake of people not, not even have the di- dignity to earn their own dollars at this point anymore. Um, I just don't see how this, this picture gets any better in a way until uh, things open up again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of glad that things are starting to open up. But, you know, there's going to be some... Uh acknowledgement of um, these these things that happen against our, you know, uh, the African Americans um, and Blacks, you know, they're, they're, this this is a time for acknowledgement of all that. I, I, I don't know the answer, Adolfo. Um, all, I, all I can do as a, as a human on this planet is to acknowledge it, you know. Yeah, 
Yeah, mm-hmm. man. And, um, you know, one of the things, too, is the, ref- the reflection of bo- or the boards and the executives on companies. I mean, what, what, they all typically kind of look the same. Let's face it. There's a pattern going on there, right? And I've noticed this over and over. I remember when I was you know, deep in the UX community and user experience community, and I'd look at a lot of these user experience agencies, and I would go to their about section and our team, right, our team section, and boy, did all those faces look the same. Right, all those faces look the same, and that made me feel terrible. Right, and every time I tried to get into any of those said companies, and was turned down, there was a little voice in the back of my head, right, saying, "Look at this pattern. You don't, you don't fit the mold. You don't fit the pattern," and um, it, it it hurts. You know, it hurts on a strange level. And then uh, you, you can apply this across the board to any other, whatever. And, and then I'll often hear the excuse that. Um, well, you know, these are qualified individuals. We're only trying to get the best. There's people rising up, pulling their own bootstraps and this and that. But in reality, it's oftentimes it's, you know, who you know. It's the particular degree or particular university that you graduated from. And there, there's some sort of brotherhood there or sisterhood there. And there's some sort of, you know, biases there. And, um, you know, man, these things add up. They add up. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I agree with you. I think it's... it's um... It, it'll be interesting world to watch in the next uh, few months of how it reacts uh, or recovers, I guess is a better word, how it recovers from all this. And I hope so. I how, really, resilient, I hope so. how resilient we could be. Um, it's, right. it's a test. <laughs> you know, you know there, was, there was an article sometime back um, by a billionaire, I think it was, or uh, his, I believe he was a million, quadrillionaire, some one of those super rich guys, right? And the title of his uh, blog post was The Pitchforks Are Coming. And this was a while ago. This was a few years ago because he knew, he saw what was coming, right? He saw this, um, this wealth inequality between the uber rich and uh, everyone else, right? And he knew that, that um, it was a powder keg waiting to explode and, and here we are. Yeah. I mean, it just, it, it, you know, when everyone has jobs, they, they tend to kind of not look elsewhere, right? When we're all working and we're all yeah. feeding our families and we're all mm-hmm. doing what we need to do to survive, life's life can be kind of normalized right but, right. You know, as soon as you remove that boy <laughs> you know i mean yeah and so i think just having the gratitude of um having the ability as a human being to feel uh, other people i think is is one of the things that i try to work on on a daily basis it's just mm-hmm. um trying to feel you know feel what these families are feeling feel what you know these other people are feeling and just try to you know it could be overwhelming at times because um you know a lot of my my friends like your, yourself and other people are suffering around me you mm-hmm. know and uh, yeah and um yeah and that's good know, sage advice though to uh to just be you know t- yeah to, to be empathetic and uh yeah be oh. be in the moment as much as you can yeah absolutely wow all right man all right on to lighter things uh, for other things <laughs> amazon uh, thanks for doing that though thank you uh let's talk yeah let's talk amazon i guess um so you know there's this story that came out before there um i think we had one show right after that and i missed this but um but uh thanks to uh nick stat um uh from uh the Verge for this. I, I, I love The Verge. Uh, Amazon gave na- TV stations coronavirus propaganda and some aired it. Numerous news stations ran segments featuring identical Amazon talking points. So let's talk about this a little bit. So hmm. Amazon has been successfully feeding talking points, video footage, and other corporate messaging to local TV news stations ahead of its annual shareholder meeting uh, at the end of May. Um, the footage and script were designed to paint Amazon in a positive light as it faces a torrent of bad media coverage and criticism from activists and politicians over its handling of workplace safety issues during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, as Zach Rael, uh, anchor of ABC affiliate KOCO5 News in Oklahoma City pointed out on Twitter um, la- uh, last week, Amazon's public relations team has been mailing East, uh, TV stations around the country with prepared scripts and B-roll packages that promote the company's safety precautions, other measures to combat COVID-19 amongst its warehouse workforce. 
So as of, as of the writing of this article, which was last week um, at the end of May, uh, eight Amazon workers have died of the virus. And I didn't realize it was that high, actually, um, according to the media and folks. And then countless others have been infected. Yet uh, Amazon has refused to dis disclose any concrete numbers around infections, deaths, uh, or cracking down on worker protests against uh, safety conditions. Uh, and failing to inform some workers when their colleagues have become ill also. Um, <laughs> and if you go look at this, uh, we have a link here. If you look at this, uh, this if you compare the script to what these uh, um, people on this YouTube video were saying, it was word for word. <laughs> it was mm -hmm. word for word. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the question in my mind, which I want to open up for discussion with you really is, you know, um, who's at fault here? Right? <laughs> you know, yeah, they're probably both at fault, but I, isn't it amazing? Uh, the propaganda, right? PR. Yeah, right? yeah, for sure. Um, I, I've seen this before. There's actually a highlight on YouTube of all the major networks uh, having talking points in, in all across the United States, and they're all, every single network is saying the same thing, right? There, there's some line, I forget what it was, like, uh, I forget what it was, something had to do with something, but they all verbatim are saying the same thing, all these multiple newscasters on different networks. And it was really creepy. And it really fed um, a lot of the, the people who are really questioning media, the mainstream media going, oh man, this is validating everything I was worried about, right? Uh, that there is a general sort of theme. And so of course, every company is gonna do this. Of course, they're gonna submit talking points. Um, for regarding their, their corporations. If they see that, uh, you know, other higher ups are doing it, of, of course, you know. Yeah, it, it's, it, it's, it's amazing, right? Because like, you know, our whole system is arranged and, you know, we get pitched by media people all the time, right? In, mm -hmm. in our email, right? Mm -hmm. right? And, and it's interesting to watch the pitches and, and how they approach it, right? And yeah. w which ones ring in my heart better than other ones, right? Mm -hmm. But but you know what this article also brought up is that um, the nature of the media it's so fast they don't have time sometimes to cut cut some of these things and so they get into this trouble of re basically regurgitation, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. this regurgitation is the one that this article is really heavily pointing out, which is to your point: Are we really being fed? on network the information as a viewing public needs to see or is it really contrived you know i mean I, mm -hmm. it, it begs the question my friend begs the yeah <laughs> it's, it's a being a pr person is a tough job you know it's funny too what i often see as well is um let's say someone's selling a garden hose um they'll tie it to the general theme of the day right so uh, how covid 18 affects your garden hose or you know what i mean how riots will affect your garden hose how you know looting how many garden hoses were stolen d during looting and they they'll just tie to any general theme of the the day it's just <laughs> and it's the same damn thing every time it's the same garden hose you know what i mean oh yeah i i mean I mean, I, I know you. It's clever, it. though. It's clever, you know. Uh, I, well, that's why they're paid for to be clever, yeah. right? But but, <laughs> yeah. but but I mean, you know, you're you're funny. It's funny you say that because, like, you know, I look at my Feedly and my Flipboard, which is really a, a two news aggregators I use, right, mm -hmm. to kind of just kind of sort through what I need to be sure. looking sure. at every day, right? But you know, it, it's interesting. Flipboard is kind of like you know, it's kind of slanted in one area. So I have to go to Feedly and actually physically put in things that I want to see come up on my feed, right? Because yeah. Yeah. I'm not getting everything, right? Yeah. I'm just getting yeah. CNN, I'm just getting, you know, CNET and, you know, whoever else, you know, and right. or whatever. But I want to see some of the, 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 the kind of the, the second, third tier players and see what they're talking about. Some of them are pretty good actually, right? right. Um, but it, 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 it's scary. At the same time, like you're 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 saying, is that you know how much um, uh, distrust of the media is, is put on, and and obviously the presence playing to that too. So yeah, right, right. you know, I mean, crazy times. Yeah, crazy yeah, times, yeah, dude. Right? I, Jeez, I, I'm like shaking my that's head. Another, yeah, that's another abstracted layer that we didn't even talk about on top of. Well, maybe we alluded to the original story was the the role of the media, right, and how what role they had in in stoking the fires or, or calming them down. You know. Yeah. It's, 
Yeah, exactly. But, you know, I, I think it's it's good to, you know, I think there's a little, many layers to this story besides just yeah. the media play. Yeah, yeah it's Amazon as well. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. All right. All right. So thanks to Emilio Molino from Wired on this particular story. Um, three weeks ago, Elena, a Krakow based customer service agent for digital banking startup Revolot, which I've never heard of, dialed in to her weekly catch-up call with her team leader. She expected them to discuss an ongoing project. Instead, a few seconds into the call, she was told she was being fired. Elena was asked to pick between two documents. One said she was being terminated for underperformance and the other, a mutual agreement, offered her a small severance and stated she was choosing to leave the company of her own accord. She was shocked. Two weeks earlier, she says her manager had assured her that her job was safe and that she was performing well. Quote, I thought maybe I should speak to another institution for legal advice because I'm a foreigner, unquote, Elena says. Uh, but they said I had no additional time and that I have 30 minutes to make this decision. Fearful for her career, Elena ended up choosing the mutual agreement. Elena is one of more than 50 employees in Poland and Portugal who it is claimed were pressured into leaving their jobs at Europe's fastest growing fintech startup since the coronavirus pandemic struck. Their numbers are not included in the recent 62 redundancies announced by Revolut because they technically agreed to leave. Revolut says redundancies represented 3% of its staff. Quote, it was pretty stressful in my friend's team. Two people were fired two hours before their shift with no warning says a form, former staff member who was dismissed in May. Current and former Revolut employees say staff were coerced into accepting terminations, even though the company had no legal grounds to fire them. Some say this happened after the company heavily pushed a voluntary scheme where staff were asked to sacrifice part of their salary in exchange for shares in the company. Revolut confirmed that a small number of employees left the business for underperformance reasons, which are valid grounds for dismissal in Poland. These employees were advised of the reason for their exit orally and in writing in a meeting with their line manager and HR manager. Let's see. Uh, this wouldn't be the first time Revolut's practices have risked falling foul of employment law. Last year, it was revealed that the company was asking applicants for business development and PR roles to recruit customers for free in order to have a chance at getting a job. Andreas Bisica, the then head of business development and one of the executives that used this hiring practice, has since been promoted to interim chief people officer, the most senior HR role within the company, according to his LinkedIn profile. The company has also been criticized for an almost religious adherence to key performance indicators, KPI, for every role from HR to recruitment to compliance. Quote, now we are always with a backlog because a lot of people were fired, unquote, the Porto-based company's customer support agent says. Quote, I think they did things too quickly, and why? Because they don't care about people, unquote. The person's name was changed to protect their identity. So pretty gross of wow. this particular startup. Wow, yeah, sorry guys. I know we're talking about a lot of heavy subjects out there in this <laughs> well, podcast. We're going back and forth, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I think, um, you know, I think that, wow, I, I guess maybe one, one, one thing reminded me of was when you were reading that, and I was reading it before that, is that I'm grateful to be in the United States, because I don't know if that type of thing would happen here. Eh. But, and but, but I me, see. I want to talk, highlight talk the startup because, yeah. yeah, I mean, st startups can behave like this. They can hire overseas workers, offshore workers, and they can, you know, treat people in certain ways. I may or may not have been treated in a similar way in the past by a particular company, and may or may not have had to have signed a similar type of situation. Um, so, I think it's just something to be aware of and something to be highlighted when it's possible, especially, you know, given that we are so involved in the startup community here. Uh, I think we need to call out this type of behavior and you, I think we're going to hear about this type of thing. Like I said, when you have a lot of people that are work and that are desperate for work, they're going to do whatever they need to do to retain their jobs. They're going to sign whatever they need to sign to get a few bucks probably on the way out, even if it is uh, unlawfully or in a very shady type of way.
Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it also kind of um, gave me a flashback when I was laid off from a big company, um, you know, um, but it, but it allowed me to kind of get into things like this. So uh, after I looked at, reflecting back, it was, I was very grateful for, for them to lay me off, actually, in fact. Right, but, right. I but, still think but, that these type of companies need to be called out for, for um, not the best practices, and then people can oh, make their, uh, their informed decisions on whether they want to purchase or do business with that yeah, type but, of, you know, but, um, I remember on, on that whole layoff thing that, uh, you know, I went to as well as, you know, thousands of others went through during that time. Um, you know, we were all kind of getting back and comparing notes and, and, and you know, you know, it, it's very contrived, right? I mean, you know, the, basically the, the manager laying you off has to stick to the script so they can't be sued, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? They, they read the script to you. And, yeah. And, and, and even if you ask them a question and like a human being, the human being, they can't answer it because they have yeah. to stick to that script. Right. 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 And right. oftentimes you can't even sue the company because oftentimes they're sort of uh, in your contract where there's only internal arbitration. So you know, yeah, it's good totally luck with crazy, that, dude. Mm -hmm. I, I, but, but that, that, that was ugly. I, I mean, that, that story was just, um, just totally ugly. I mean, well, I think we're going to talk about another story very similar too with another oh, company. Right? Okay. You want to go into that? <laughs> no, 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 not yet. Let's go into the next thing. All right. <laughs> Or, or maybe, yeah, let's go right into it, right? Yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you so much. What a much. great segue. Yeah, I know, God. Uh, so there's been never a better time to quit Facebook. And I mean, uh, at you as a person um, of, uh, in the social media, right? Um, thank you. And, and obviously, if you, you've been under a rock, you probably, mm -hmm. and you probably haven't heard, but um, there was this thing we reported on last week during our podcast about, you know, Twitter, you know, putting a fact check um, uh, statement on President Trump's tweet, all right? And so with that set off, and, um, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the CEO of Facebook, um, you know, stated that, you know, I don't think social media companies or private companies should be in the business of uh, doing that type of stuff. Now, that just sent a wild <laughs> fire through Facebook where, you know, people were then resigning because of that. Um, they had, I think this last Monday, um, they basically uh, staged a uh, no work day, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. right? I actually thought that's what this story was about was uh, because you, you put on in the title there, it says uh, a great uh, something to quit Facebook. I thought you were talking about actual employees of Facebook quitting no, Facebook. Yeah, yeah. I just I, read a blog of an employee that actually did. He wrote a big, you know, beautiful, eloquent type of thing where he's saying, you know, I'm leaving the company because of these particular morals or, or what you're, what you're getting at here. Yeah. I mean, this article goes on to say is that he, he's grateful. He, he, um, he quit Facebook because of this, this, this S storm that's really uh, brewing in, in Facebook land there, you know, he, he's saying that uh, Zuckerberg as a leader refuses to rock the boat. You know, and it, and and that's what his employees are very pissed off about, right? I oh, mean, so you are talking about that yeah, too, yeah, as yeah, well yeah, as quitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So 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 again, going back, um, you know, they see Jack Dorsey actually standing up for for what his company did, right? And then they see Mark Zuckerberg, uh, uh, you know, you know, unquestionably the biggest social media outlet there in in the world, right? Saying that, you know, I don't think we need to do do this, you know. Um, and, and then I see all these, these reports coming out now, you know, the people are actually, um, I think I read another thing that kind of supports all this, uh, another article earlier, uh, today that, you know, the people who wrote the, uh, policy for, for Facebook and the social media on, on, on posting said, you know, this is not what they envisioned what they were supposed to do when, when something like this would come up. So they're just... Facebook is just reeling right now. And, mm -hmm. and again, it, it goes back to that thing where people are feeling uncomfortable out there. Uh, not only the users of Facebook, but the employees of Facebook, you know, they're faced with a lot of these things going around them in the world. And right. they're saying like, you know, you know, let's, let's get on, the, let's, let's, let's get on the train, man. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's interesting because there are two, 
two factions here equating Facebook, the employees and the users. So yeah, uh, the, I've actually seen a couple of people and, and this seems to be, and we've talked about this before too, um, these trends of people going, I'm gonna quit Facebook and then they leave and then they come back. And I think we're there again, where I'm starting to see people going, you know, hey, this, this time I'm really out of here, you know, and some people are quitting and looking for alternatives again. Yeah, and you know, I, I saw in this story also, you know, I, and the stories that, that are reading about this is, you know, they, you know, many, many civic leaders have come to Facebook to meet with Mark and, and Cheryl. Um, not that I know him by first name, but I just call him Mark and Cheryl at this point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but I, I, I just kind of like, you know, um, you know, there's that accountability factor eventually, you know, and do you really believe social media is not a media company, but just, just a platform, right? And, and, and everyone keeps on always going back to the platform, a wall or a shroud, right? But, you know, when you're a media company, and then we talked about this last week, right? Is that, you know, how much of it should be filtered, you know, because like we do believe in, um, as yeah. you and I talk about on this podcast, you know, First Amendment rights, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And this is this is interesting, but you know, it's also a leadership thing uh, on Mark's standpoint. I think I think he could have made it, even though he believed this. Um, uh, there could have been a way he could have probably saved his face on this a little bit more. Oh, but, totally. You know, right? And, and and Twitter as well, though, too, because I mean, they're they've been canceling people's accounts and and just willy nilly, you know, a lot of these people who have opposing opinions of certain things, like a shelter in place, or whatever, too. And and now uh, they they let uh, Trump say whatever he wants. He gets the exception. So it's been very inconsistent in terms of enforcement. And Facebook's uh, same situation really on Facebook. So it's yeah. just um, yeah. What are you gonna do? Yeah, I, I say let everyone say whatever the hell they want. You know. Yeah, but, yeah. I, I think I think you need to. And then obviously you have to. You know, just like what we do is we read many different stories. I mean, I what I like what you always do, you lead, you read everything from the left to the right to the libertarian to whatever, you know, just to kind of get a feel for what's going on. And I, I really appreciate that, actually. Um, I don't do enough of that, I'll be honest with you, but I appreciate what you do by reading all those different stories. So Thanks. Well, you know what I appreciate is the speed round. <laughs> speed round, speed round. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Thanks to uh, Science Daily for this next story. Low omega-3 could explain why some children struggle with reading. So this one's in, uh, from the University of Oxford. It was the source. The summary of the study says a new study has shown that a representative sample of UK school children aged seven to nine years had low levels of key omega-3 fatty acids in their blood. Furthermore, the study found that children's blood levels of the long chain omega-3 DHA, the form found in most abundance in the brain, significantly predicted how well they were able to concentrate and learn. Uh, in Oxford. So yeah, thanks to the Oxford University for finding this is out. This is uh, really great information. I just thought I want to pass that along to you parents out there. Uh, I know I made it a priority for my teenager uh, back then to, to try to get some of these things. And luckily she loves sushi. Um, so I'm sure we were getting some good omega-3s and just some little dietary health tip information for you people out there during the speed round. Wow. All right. Thank you for that tip. I'm going to get some more <laughs> uh, omega-3 eggs uh, right after this thing, man. Yeah, so, so, speed round. Anyway, speed round. <laughs> okay, Upwork. If you don't know Upwork, it's uh, the, one of the biggest platforms in terms of trying to uh, get freelancers work. And so the... Um, uh, Thanks to Fortune for this, uh, Rachel Shalom. Uh, you know, the Upwork CEO uh, uh, announced that, you know, uh, she really thinks that uh, it's a great time for um, uh, companies and freelancers, they say. So um, is that they think the coronavirus pandemic has really has changed the way that companies are going to be using freelancers, you know, work from home, um, another way of maybe doing a secret project on the side, using freelancers and not letting everyone know about something. There, there's a lot of alternatives here for companies that are going to more of a work from home, uh, uh, you know, economy or, or company. And so uh, she's saying that she really thinks it's a great time in the in workforce for freelancers. So if you're a freelancer out there, 
you know, get on board, get on board with Upwork. I've used it uh, several times and uh, I'm pretty happy with it actually. So very cool. Speed round. <laughs> All right. Thanks to Lifehacker. And oh gosh, her, she has one of those three name names. Here we go. Megan Morovic Swalbert. Uh, and the title of her story is Throw a Welcome Whoa. to Summer Party for Your Kids. And I thought this was a really cool idea. Most school years go out with a bang. There are end of year concerts, field days, school wide picnics, and all sorts of other pomp and circumstances here. It's going out with barely, barely more than a whimper. As uh, a teacher dropping by to say a socially distanced goodbye, a final Zoom call with classmates, with everything feeling so bleak at the moment, one thing we can celebrate is the start of summer by marking it with a party. And then she goes on to list all kinds of really cool um, little ideas, right? So of course you can't really go anywhere or even invite a slew of people over to join you in the celebration, but that doesn't mean it can't be fun. Here are a few other welcome to summer party ideas to get you started. You can string up balloons and or streamers around the home or backyard, have a backyard picnic or their favorite meal for dinner, dust off and pull out the old summer toys or yard games, surprise them with a few new summer treats or toys such as bubbles, water balloons or water shooters, set up an obstacle course around the backyard. Yeah, I would have loved that as a kid. Turn up the music and have a dance party, but of course, have a water fight. Uh, as a bonus, this is a good stress reliever for the for the whole family, as they say. So nice ideas for your parents out there, you know, to end this weird school year. I hope uh, this gives you some incentives or sparks some some uh, fun ideas for you. All right, I want those Instagram videos of you and your daughter doing that this uh, this summer. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> speed round, speed round, speed round. <laughs> okay, well you're gonna kill me for this, Adolfo, but I'm gonna bring another cinema. <laughs> movie thing yeah, to our nice. podcast so uh the, <laughs> let's see uh spring wise for this um and uh Kari anderson um uh, on my one of my twitter friends brought this up in my feed um the project brings cinema to our backyards so a german project is screening movies on the sides of buildings to allow neighbors to watch together from their windows awesome. so yeah yeah i thought that was kind of cool so german project window flicks has an answer for this the project brings the cinemas to people by projecting films onto the exteriors of residential buildings, allowing the entire neighborhood to watch from their windows. <laughs> so I thought it was cool. Uh, I love it. Berlin residents, this is in Germany, my, friend, my friends, uh, uh, my friends or something like that, can apply to window flicks to participate, but must live in an area where at least 20 residential units can have an unobstructed view of a large wall. <laughs> the projector and other equipment are installed in one unit in a room uh, with the window facing the screen, which is the wall. Um, so anyway, the organizers are offering screenings for free and even supply free popcorn, but encourage residents to make donations, which all goes towards supporting German independent movie theaters. So anyway, that, I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, we can't get around uh, movies and, and drive-ins and all this stuff. So I decided to bring one back again. So, all right, speed round. Right, all right, tip time, speed right? down. No. Oh, tip time, tip, tip time, time, tip time. Tip time. Tip time. <laughs> all right. So this one actually comes from the Signal blog. Signal's an application, a very super private sort of messaging application that are a lot of people are using and uh, as opposed to something like a Facebook Messenger or even a messages uh, such that it's super super private and doesn't get out a lot of people are using this I would suggest you use it too and this one was Moxio is the name of the author uh, what what they're saying is one immediate thing that seems clear 2020 is a pretty good year to cover your face the latest version of signal for Android and iOS introduces a new blur feature in the image editor that can help protect the privacy of people in the photos you share now, it's easy to give every face a hiding place or draw a fuzzy trace over something you want to erase. Uh, simply tap on the new blur tool icon to get started. The update has already been submitted to the app stores and will be begin rolling out as soon as possible. So it's uh, fantastic stuff. It basically encrypts your face and all kinds of great stuff. Also, they want to do uh, something outside of the app too. They'll be distributing versatile face coverings to the community free of charge. Uh, they've been working to find a manufacturer capable of producing high volumes of face coverings in the current global circumstances. They say, we're finalizing a few remaining details and provide more information soon. Speak freely, stay safe, and send a message is what they say. So the face covering will have that sort of pixelation pattern such that facial recognition cameras will be confused and will not function properly. So for a lot of you people that are trying to fight Big Brother, this is uh, an awesome, awesome nice. company. And uh, they're fighting for you. 
Nice. Wow. That's tip a great time. tip. Tip time. Tip time. Okay, my tip. Um, I've been doing Google tips, uh, Maps tips. Yeah, right Google Maps again. Forever. Here we go. Yeah, I like that. I like Google Maps, okay? It's Don't like give me a hard time here. about that, all right? It's a new theme. Don't, okay. <laughs> Don't give me a hard time about this, all right? <laughs> anyway, anyway, Google Maps makes it easy to use and send plus codes. What the hell are plus codes, you're probably yeah, saying? What is that? Yeah, yeah. So plus, if you're hearing about plus codes for the first time, you're probably not alone. And uh, and most people are not familiar with it. It's a digital address that is based on longitude and latitude coordinates of your mm. current location. Mm. And, um, and, and if you don't realize, Google has said that more than 2 billion people don't have an address or don't have a residence that is easy to uh, locate. If you, friends, if you've been to Tokyo, Japan, you would totally understand that. There's mm -hmm. no freaking addresses there. Yeah, so yeah. now they're making it easy for you to know and share your plus code, uh, the digital address that was really launched back in 2015, believe it or not. So wow. um, if you want to know your plus code is, open up Google Maps, look for the blue dot that identifies your current location. Make sure it's <laughs> first that it's the correct location, of course. And tap the blue dot and you'll be able to be led to the, a blue page where you'll see things like see nearby places, share your location, uh, etc. Look at the item at the top of all those options and you'll see your location and an alphanumeric code which may be combined with a location. Um, and then uh, you could share that, send it to a person because if, if you're in a place that doesn't have a uh, address that you could really easily identify, especially at night, you just send that along and they'll find you willy Lickety split, I guess. Okay. Split. Yeah. Hey, great tip, Greg. Wow. Right. Look at you going deep in the paint with Google Maps. I, I, I was a doubter at first, <laughs> but now I'm a believer. I did not know about that tip. That's a good one. Okay, cool. All right. Well, All anyway, right, you guys. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone for watching, listening out there. Again, please give us a, a nice rating on uh, iTunes store and uh, give us five stars. If you're watching this, please thumbs up, subscribe and hit that bell. So you'll be notified every time. Also, don't forget us to check us out on Patreon, patreon.com forward slash nerdstalker. Uh, we'd love your support. Uh, I am Adolfo Fronda at nerdstalker on Twitter. Greg, where can we find and get more information about you? You contact me uh, by email at socialgreg at nerdstalker.com or you can reach me on Twitter at, at socialgreg. And uh, hey, thank you for a great episode. I think uh, we got a lot of things off our chest. All right. Thanks, man. All right. Thanks for everyone. Be careful out there. She looked at me and slammed the